Right. Now, I think we are... Yeah, it's, it's the right time. So I'm going to switch a camera and uh, recall myself saying a few words. Good. Can everyone on the uh, a Zoom meeting, can, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Welcome everyone to the, the first of these um, hybrid events that combines people from around the world and within uh, traveling distance to London, where uh, we have a, a several people gathered and it's very nice to see some old friends from the times when we used to meet here before uh, lockdown. As is the custom of these meetings, I should say a few words in Old Norse, light the candle and introduce the subject. So if we can uh, try to uh, clear our minds uh, of the thoughts of the day and centre ourselves a little bit. A flame is quickened by another flame, a flame a man from another man may become wiser, but from seed may remain ignorant. Like the sky above your soul. Gods of the peoples and lands, may we spend this time together in friendship with you and with each other as new The Odyssey uh, graciously grants us the refreshing pleasures of a pristine world free from pollution. And we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Speak into the mic. Uh, can, can, can you hear me now? A little better, not much. A little better, okay. Uh, is, 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 that, is that loud enough to hear? I can hear you loud enough. No. Okay. Um, that's, that's better. Yeah. Well, I'll, 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 I should start again. Um, the Odyssey graciously grants us the refreshing pleasures of a pristine world, free from pollution, overpopulation, and if I may say so, political correctness. A world in which the less than perfect beings, namely we the mortals, lived in a healthy acknowledgement of the powers, puissant and divine, that stand over the land, the sky, the heavens, and that spin our fate. And they still do, however we might envision them. This epic poem, as we all know, is one of the finest fruits of that tree, which naturally unfolded at its own pace from the earliest roots of who we are. A similar tree, a sapling from the common source, had thrived in Northern Europe, but we neglected it, and it uh, it left behind us no such vivid and large vision of how it once was, which we are blessed with in the Odyssey, and through which we may glimpse a past part of ourselves that we have lost. And we may use it to find our future, I think, like a dog who's given a piece of cloth and by its scent can find its owner. What can we learn from the Odyssey? I think it helps one See the bones of one's body is still strong under the clothes in which one is accustomed to see it. Uh, according to the distorted mirrors of the age, warped as they are by whatever uh, the fashionable theorists care to conduct and, and spread upon its surface. It teaches us humility. If Odysseus had not turned back to his thoughts uh, over blinding the sight loss and escaping, then Lord Poseidon. Uh, who, who is the father of the Cyclops, would have enabled him to reach Ithaca quicker with less travails and um, without uh, so great a loss of men. The Odyssey is a journey of the self to its ultimate destination, as well, I believe, as more things than we would be able to imagine. For, like all classics rooted in the eternal, it will always have something to say that is new. And I think Yanis uh, will have much to say that would be new to many of us. 
Therefore, Yanis, please, uh, I invite you to, to, to speak. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stead, for this invitation and these wonderful uh, people that you are around. Uh, I wish one day all of you to come to Greece, to Santorini, and uh, be all together here in this uh, beautiful place under that light, the cycladic light that is under the jurisdiction of Apollo. Uh, I'm going to speak to you about the Odyssey. It is a work that I'm uh, doing the last 20 years that I'm uh, um, studying the Odyssey. I decided to stop uh, studying the Odyssey and just live with her from now on. Uh, <clears throat> also, a big thanks to uh, Antonios Karasoulas that he invited me to your uh, symposium, to your company. And it's uh, very important that Antonios did that because Antonios is actually from Ithaca and he's uh, an archer. So I don't know what, when it was the last time that somebody from Ithaca, he knew how to stretch a bow. And uh, today I'm gonna speak to you about uh, the Odyssey, the greatest story ever told, is a book that shaped our world. Uh, Odyssey has many layers of understanding. You can look the Odyssey from a grammatic art, how the grammatic art of the book is being structured. You can look the symbolic uh, language of Homer, as we're going to do today. Also, Odyssey is uh, various maps to travel around the world that I'm going to give you some information today. And it is a music score. The whole epic poem, it is a music score with rhythm and melody. So I'm going to start my presentation. I'm going to read from my text that I have here. I wish my English to be understandable from everyone because I speak England very best. <laughs> so uh, let's start. Sing in me, muse, and through me. Tell the story of that man, skilled in all ways of contending, the wanderer, harried for years on end, after he plundered on the stronghold of the proud height. He saw the townlands and learn the minds of many distant men. And whether many bitter nights and days in his deep heart at sea, while he fought only to save his life, to bring his shipmates home. If there is one mythological journey that tell us in an archetypical way about the search of our true identity, it is the journey of Odysseus. The resourceful hero emerges, along with many others victorious from the Trojan campaign, but he was one of the few who managed to face his homeland again. After a long wandering and through many and difficult trials, 
he arrived one day again in his kingdom, having lost on the way all his companions. For Odysseus, every stop on the way back was a valuable experience. Each station, he had to learn something about himself and at the same time, prove his will to continue to Ithaca. He was boldly left on a long and uncertain journey in which one disappointment follows another. It is perhaps extremely interesting that the God who chases Odysseus and forces him to pass through the 12 stations is Poseidon. In mythology, Poseidon is considered the god of charm and frustration, but also the god of ideal and the dream. Nevertheless, he is not, as we often believe, a gentle and romantic god. On the contrary, he is an angry and cruel god. And how else could be since Poseidon has the mission to shake us and wake us from those dreams which are deceptive. He rules the waters, that is the senses, but also the illusions. It sends us the big, our true dreams and ideals. It mobilizes through the nostalgia of some Ithaca and then it does not leave us in peace until it makes us sure that we are going there. Poseidon, however, does not want our evil, just wants, no God wants evil from the man. I have to tell you now that through this presentation, you will realize that Odysseus and Jesus is the same archetypes. Odysseus, Jesus, he wanted to go to see his father and the Odyssey finishes like that. Uh, Odysseus meet his father. Jesus goes to the underworld and he resurrects, same as Odysseus. Uh, it's completely the same archetype. According to Greek mythology, three brothers, Zeus, Poseidon and Hades, share the world as brothers. They constructed the world in Trinity. The upper world belongs to Zeus. The lower world is given to Hades. And the intermediate world, our world, is to Poseidon. Poseidon is the lord of the earth and waters, the waters inside us that sometimes are turbulence and sometimes they are calm. From the moment the drop leaves the cloud, and falls, falls on the ground, it is in a sense within its jurisdiction. The journey of, fifth, of each drop to the sea, the water cycle, is ruled by this mysterious God. And Poseidon wants the drop to reach the sea one day, just as he also wants to lead Odysseus to Ithaca. Poseidon, Odyssey. The road, however, is not straight, nor it is easy. That is why water has patience and memory. In the long run, water proves to be a powerful element. Moisture penetrates even the cement, and there is nothing that can prevent the water from reaching its destination in the long run. For water, the fastest way to the sea is the river. All rivers have their paths in the earth, and these paths are, at first sight, inexplicable. They have turns, they have branches and turbulence. Homer says that Cersei had four maids who were born out of fountains and sacred rivers. Odysseus' wanderings may seem pointless and may have been tedious and dangerous, yet they were certainly necessary. 
They were the fastest road to Ithaca. But what is Ithaca? An island or ultimately a transcendental purpose. More people today perceive Greek mythology as something that belongs to the past and therefore does not concern them. And this is because the stories are made in such a way as to hide their meanings from the ignorant who will alter the eternity that is hidden inside them. Greek mythology has at least 33 layers of understanding as I searched from my research. You can see one name or one story from a cosmogenic point of view, how the world was created, from a physics point of view, from medicine, from psychology, from geology, and many ologies. I will give you an example to understand what is the multi-layer scientific background of Greek mythology. When Apollo, the leader of these instruments, was born, his father Zeus, he sent seven swans to make seven circles around him, and that's the end of the story. Does not make sense at all. When we have a number in mythology, always speaks about an internal and an external phenomenon. Apollo is the ruler of music and lights and light. How many colors we have in light? How many notes in music? The name Apollon has seven letters. That is an example because light and music works in circles. That's an example how the poetic art of these incredible minds, incredible minds, perceived natural phenomena and they gave it in a poetic art to be able to hide the internal message. I continue. And this is because the stories are made in such a way to hide the meaning. Plato accepts the dramaturgy of mythical narratives that aim at truth and good. This alone is in accordance with the true dimension of the Olympians. Proclus, the Neoplatonic philosopher, in Plato's theology, quotes, the way of mythology is ancient and implying the divine and spreading many curtains in front of the truth. The ancient poets consider it good to reconstruct more tragically the secret knowledge about the gods, and that is why they created deceptions of the gods, incest, mutilations, wars, blood feuds, kidnappings, adulteries, and many other such symbols of the hidden truth about the divine. The most important thing that these people did is they put in front of the stories the most important vibration in our species, sexuality. By putting sexuality in front of the stories, they made them immortal. The desymbolization and symbolism, a historical event, plays an important role. Every story is connected to a historical moment. Before the, the, uh, the, uh, the discovery of Sliman, people thought that Troy was something imaginary. A historical event plays an important role, an event that changes something and establishing something new, establishes something new. This was found as an occasion by the philosophical schools when they were mythologizing. After composing an event fact, they made an appropriate, appropriate narration with which they matched the secret they wanted to hide and keep it over time. They abolished space-time. The Odyssey is a multi-layered universe one can see it from a cosmogenic point of view, ontological, physical, psychological, and musical. Recently, been shown that a map leading to America, while a study has been done that shows that with the method of anagrams, there is a book hidden in the existing one. Greek language and other languages has 
one specific characteristic. When you have a word like the word onoma, that is name, when you vice versa the word, change, you change the, the letters, becomes nomos, that is law. And this shows to us that every name is law. This happens in every Greek word. One incredible researcher that he had an enlightenment, he proved that the Odyssey is a book inside the book. There is actually another book underneath. Can you imagine the capacity of mentality you need to do that? Nonetheless, the many these of distant things that are not related to modern life, we must ignore the way of thinking so the truth can appear. Our perception of modern material world is very limited and suffocating. There is a whole world super sensible and timeless in which myth is unfolding. Myth is a part of our sacred memory along with our traditions and history. We, without it, we are in danger of being degraded at the level of the humblest animal. Odyssey is the national poem of the Greeks, the chant of the spread of Hellenism on the Black Sea coast and the Mediterranean basin. There are not few who today argue with evidences that Odysseus traveled to the islands and the coast of the Atlantic Ocean and to what is today the America. Here we see modern place names of apparent Greek etymology on the west of Norway. Mykines, Mykinin, Nafsika, Nafsital, Mykinin, Nauftes. Hellenes, Nafstikaten, Alsos, Hellenes, Nost, Hellenes, Nafsin, Hellenes, Mikines, Nafthilen, Samia, Hellas, Bacchus, Mikines. Even today in Norway, they call Greece Hellas. What is happening? Uh, Greeks, the Odyssey is a uh, complete map, map how to go to. Um, the great continent on the other side of the Atlantic, as the Greeks called it. The Greeks called America Esperia. Odyssey is a hidden map that shows how to go actually and to reach Newfoundland, what is today Newfoundland. Greeks had colonies in the uh, north of Norway that it was transition stations because they were extracting valuable resources. Back then, the valuable resources, it was very important for these incredible people that they did things above, beyond our imaginations. The, the analysis of uh, how the Greeks made colonies in Hyperborea is another thing uh, of discussion. His name is Odysseus, which means the one who suffers. Or his name means the path of essence, or those who see us. At a higher mental level is the cosmic force which enters internally, eternally. Odysseus is in the Homeric representation and in the Greek tradition the representative of the mental development. He is a solar hero and his 12 adventures run through the Zodiac. The hero's son is a latent, latent possibility in the dreams of each of the ordinary people. Each of us can become one. Odysseus is an archetype. Odysseus with his pains and sufferings but that he can defeat with the Penelope soul. Penelope is the soul of the universe and our soul. That awaits him in his kingdom, which is threatened by the suitors. 
that is the illegal forces of, of selfishness, passions, and lower desires. Also today, it is the complete political system. In a symbolic key of interpretation, the conquest of Penelope at the end of the epic represents the house after the 12 zodiac adventures that Odysseus must overcome before reaching Ithaca. It symbolizes the house of the last conquest of the soul and the throne of the solar kingdom, which belongs to the hero, rightly before his karmic wanderings or missions to the land of pain. The zodiacal symbolism of Homer's entire work becomes more apparent with references to various parts of some constellations, which were important not only for sailors and orientation at the time, which may be much more ancient than we think, but also for the whole symbolic course of the hero sun in his zodiac journey, which is indeed an odyssey in a modern sense of the word. This journey symbolizes the sufferings and adventure of human consciousness on earth as it is located in search of the lost queen, the superior of the soul. The sea in the Odyssey, it is life, full of surprises, obstacles, and traps. At the end of the trip of life, all vanity is abundant, and clothed as beggars, we must appear in the final test, where every right and everyone will be evaluated. Odyssey is Greeks, Greece's national epic. It is the loyal depiction of life and the spread of the Greek rulers at sea, whose heart beat in the episode with terror, but also of hope. From that time until today, Greece has the largest merchant fleet on the planet. Odysseus was one of the most popular heroes of the Greek epos, and his accomplishment flooded not only the epic cycle of Trojan War, the Iliad and the Odyssey, but also a multitude of other epics lost now, as it is the Ethiopians. Odysseus is the bold seaman who cautiously and deliberately faces the risks and skillfully overcomes the obstacles. He is the most prominent Greek hero. The clever, the inexhaustible, with the convincing eloquence and resourcefulness. The man without wrath and passion, but with computation and rationality, the founder of cities, the warrior. The city of Lisbon, Lisboa, as we know it today, took the name from Ulysses, Ulissapona, or the, and the name Lisboa comes from the name of Ulysses, that's why on the port of Lisboa, they have the Tower of Ulysses. And um, Varkelonia, Barcelona, was uh, founded by Hercules. The type of the man that has a strong will who craves something with force and achieve it, achieves it. His compassion reaches the deceit, but his courage is always inseparable from his logic and composure. The Greeks achieved great things with this archetype model of Odysseus, and it is impossible to realize today how much it is being achieved due to this model. BBC recently made um, a research, what is the most important books that shape the world? And number one, it is Odyssey. Odyssey is the exciting cinematic story with parallel narration and exotic shooting locations, games with time, games with the shapes of gods who transform themselves into humans or birds. During medieval times, the Odyssey, it was considered to be a, a pornographic uh, literature. <laughs> yes, they were reading and they were imagining actually how Odysseus spent seven years on the years on the bed of Calypso. Many who transformed themselves into animals, as in the story of the island of Circe, in Ithaca, where the king becomes a beggar. 
games with the worlds, the world of humans, the world of gods, the world of monsters, and finally, the underworld. The feeling begins. Pisces. The zodiac sign, this zodiac sign is the final test in his solar journey of Odysseus, which Homer tells us second in the series, thus creating a symbolic reversal. The sign of Pisces is the last and the end of the sufferings of Odysseus on the island of Phaeacians before reaching his fate at the end of his search in Ithaca. So, Homer symbolically identifies us with the events of the Odyssey at the beginning of the great age, Aries year, that is about 4,200 years ago. With the symbolism of the structure with which he begins the narration of the starting point of Odysseus suffering in the work, shows us inversely the age of Pisces, which will begin in 200 BC about and after Aquarius that follows and started in the 50s. The sign of Pisces has dominant the planet Poseidon, which is symbolically present for the last time in this phase and causes the calamity of Odysseus. The god of the sea shakes the waters and causing a causes a terrible storm. Odysseus to be shipwrecked once again, but he is saved by following Calypso's advice to abandon his raft and after losing them all, he arrives naked on the island of Phaeacians. At this point, the hero as son finally says goodbye to the enemy god Poseidon, ruler of Pisces. On the island of Phaeacians, the psychological characteristics of Pisces makes their appearance. Hospitality, charity, generosity. The risk of loss of value, protection, are Pisces elements that we find clearly in the face of the rest of Odysseus on the island of Phaeacians, below the King Alcino's hospitality and emotional, emotional sweet love of his daughter, Nafsika. Yamas. Studying this rhapsody, the interested reader will recognize the futures of the traditional astrology attributes to the sign of Pisces. Here, the quest, the guest Odysseus begins to narrate, narrate adventures before he reads Calypso, which led him to this sad situation in front of King Alkinos and Queen Ariti. The countdown starts from the moment of departure from Troy to his homeland. From the sign of origin, Aries, will begin the hero, son, his resourceful Odysseus, the resourceful Odysseus, the zodiac adventure. In order not to tire the listener with cert certainty that he is well acquainted with the Homeric tradition and detailed descriptions of passions and travel of Odysseus, I would prefer to be very brief and concise in the reports of the various phases of his wanderings. Kikonians, the price of greed. Greed blinds and devastates. Odysseus reveals his identity to King Alkinos, stating his full name, Odysseus, son of Laertes. He is also tell him that he comes from Ithaca, place he has not seen eyes on for years, and he has been struggling at sea for very long. Afterwards, he recounts to the royal people that he has been through. At first, upon departing from Troy, the wind threw his ships on Ismaros to the land of Kikonians. 
There, he decided to raid the land and pillage it with his men. They took spoils and women, but he respected Maron's Apollon priest and his son and did not kill them. In the photo, we see the Apollos priest Maron giving to Odysseus the sweet wine that with this sweet wine he uh, put uh, Polyphemus in sleep. In return, Maron gave them seven pieces of gold and a silver cup of 12 of divine unwatered wine. After raiding and pillaging Odysseus' companions sat by the shore eating, drinking, and celebrating their victory instead of leaving immediately. Odysseus tried to convince victory instead of leaving immediately. Odysseus tried to convince them to leave, but it was in vain. For this behavior, he called them childish. While they were eating and drinking, the Kikonians found the time to call for reinforcements and then all together, they attacked Odysseus and his companions. They were thousands, but nonetheless, Odysseus and his men were winning during the day. Yet, when the sun went down, it was the Kikonians who were winning. Thus, six men out of reach of Odysseus' ships were killed. The rest barely escaped and tried to set sail any way they could but not before they had summoned the dead, meaning calling three times the names of their companions who were killed by the Kikonians. Their name of Kikonians means those in power of mind. Arrogance leads to foolishness. Foolishness leads to devastation. In this instance, we see immature parts of the psyche beset by faults, such as greed and arrogance. Why do we speak of greed? We have to remember where Odysseus and his companions were returning from, the defeated pillars Troy. Being the victors, they had already taken lush spoils from the defeated city, which was renowned for its treasures. Therefore, they were not returning home empty-handed. Yet, intoxicated by their victory, they felt almost omnipotent. So, greed and arrogance led them to pillage the Kikonians who had not hurt them in any way. Greed and arrogance are traits of the immature psyche. This is confirmed by the foolishness they exhibited in refusing to depart immediately. All through Odysseus had urged them to do so. This was why he rightfully called them childish. Before they felt undefeatable, they were not in any rush to live, but instead continuing eating and drinking, immersed in the foolishness of their overgrown ego. Nevertheless, the universal laws cannot forgive such behavior. And so, a steep price had to be paid and a valuable material had to be lost. Odysseus's very own companions. Yet, we have to point out that they had shown mercy towards Maron, Apollo's priest, and following Odysseus' orders, they had not killed him. The divine wine he offered Odysseus as a reward will prove extremely useful in the future. Because of the life he saved, the divine drink, drink will help him save his own life. When Odysseus left Troy, he started with 12 ships filled with spoils and companions. 
However, those were 12 levels which required cleansing, same as Jesus Christ's disciples. There are useful and useless experiences. Both kinds are conquered and not granted, just like the spoils which represent the useless, utterly materialistic experiences. This is why, in the end, Odysseus will return without any of the spoils to Ithaca, which symbolizes the return to the spiritual homeland. Moreover, he will return without his companions, without the lower, worthless parts of his psyche. He will gradually lose all of his spoils and companions until he is left naked and alone. From the aspect of the aspect of the ego, this will seem like a disaster. Yet, from the aspect of the higher self, this is cleansing. In reality, all that will be lost are illusions, faith in worthless mortal things. Having removed what is future, fut futile, we are left with the essential. Thus, Odysseus' psyche will be mature enough and will awaken in terms of his true identity. Then, and only then, will he regain his kingdom, his homeland, and his beloved ones. However, until that time, he will experience its purge of spoils or companions as loss, and he will mourn, being unaware of the fact that the poorer and loner he, loner he becomes on that level, the richer will become at the closer he will get to his people, that is, his family and his homeland. The ritual of the summoning the dead at the end has a double meaning. The first aspect is to call all the deceased attributes of the psyche by their name, so that their loss was absolutely conscious. According to the ancient Greek philosophy, you can download the vibration in a, with a specific technique of a deceased relative or of an archetype. The second aspect relates to the fact that the dead and not the living were summoned. In other words, they call the spirit of the dead, meaning the spiritual energy. This is because every one of Odysseus' companions who perished, that is, every part of himself with lower motives, lower thoughts and emotions, was eliminated by dying. But at the same time, he released the amount of energy he possessed so as to exist. Therefore, the energy which was being used for lower purposes now freely returned to Odysseus and, strengthened, and gave him strength. This is precisely why, while his companions were perishing, he was losing all of his old identity solidifying inside him a higher quality, which will allow him to return to his divine homeland. The ships set off in a hurry and sail at sea, but the winds were not favorable. There were fears that they forced them to gather the sails and find a peaceful shore to moor the ships. The winds were howling for three days until on the third day, the weather improved and they set off again. But the good wind did not last for long. Upon reaching Cape Malea, the north wind from the island of Kithira threw them off course and turned them towards a different direction. They were struggling with the waves for nine days. As we see in this instance, the final departure was first delayed for three days 
and then for another nine days. We could say that this corresponds to the three and the nine days of dead. In ancient Greece, burial honors included rituals and sacrifices to the dead on the third day and on the ninth day of the individual passing. In modern times, very similar rituals are present, preserved by the Greek Orthodox Church. Therefore, Homer provides something, some esoteric information. After an internal cleansing, the death of the lower states of mind, faults and illusions, a period of immobility and concentration is required so that the necessary inner adaption may take place. Strength must first be regained for the psyche to be able to face the winds of the astral and mental fields, which will break loose for nine days. It could even be that Odysseus and his companions should have remained in a period of concentration and regrouping for 40 days. By departing sooner, after 12 days in total, the psyche was not ready to steer its ship correctly. It could not overcome the force of the mental winds. Things are still immature and thus Odysseus will face new hardships. Six men from every ship of Odysseus killed. You may notice that Homer's, that Homer's obsession with three, six, nine, and 12. This will be analyzed later. We are on the, right now, we are on the zodiac sign of Aries. In the land of Kikones, Odysseus says, the wind brought him after he started from Troy. There he looted and killed with his comrades, carried away by the legendary element of Ares, god of war. But they were delayed in, in living, and the Kikones, the angry warriors, rushed upon them, and there were many casualties among Odysseus' companions, who fled to the ships. Violent catastrophe, war, conflict, impetus, impatience, hasty decisions, Aggressions are elements of areas which accompany the first adventure of the return journey from Troy, the hero. The sweet fruits of the lotus eaters do not eat the fruit of oblivion. On the 10th day, they arrived at the land of the lotus eaters who were feeding on flowers. The lotus eaters, as Odysseus admits, did not mean to do him and his companions any harm, but they offered them the sweet fruits of the lotus to eat, and as a result, they forgot about their homeland and about everything else. All they wanted to do was stay there, eating lotus. Still, Odysseus took his companions by force, even though they were crying. He very swiftly gathered everyone who had not yet had the chance to taste the fruits, took them all with him and left. Then he reaches the country of the lotus eaters. The people are extremely friendly. They deliver sweet, pleasant food but it has the power to make anyone who eats to forget. The lotus eaters are hedonists, presenting all kinds of temptations. The lotus refers to the pleasure of flesh. The Homeric food of the flower reduces to the early enjoyment of pleasure. This deceives the mind which does not develop. According to Proclus, the Neoplatonic philosopher, the gods are perceived by the flower of the mind. Every name in the Odyssey and every story 
has to do with the development of mentality, something that you will see uh, very soon. So Proclus said that gods are perceived by the flower of mind. So when the soul is left to pleasure, it is as if it cancels its mental function, as if it eats the flower of the mind and abolishes the levitation to higher spheres. And in this island make its appearance for the first time the threat of forgetfulness. It is a theme that repeats itself in the Odyssey. The lotus eaters are simple, peace-loving, open, and welcoming the strangers, offering their visitors the fruit of lotus. It is a food that looks like a flower and sweet like honey. Thus, this food becomes the greatest threat of all, the loss of memory. Everything in this epic story conspires that Odysseus forgets who truly is and what is his goals, what his goals are. To forget Nostos, the return to his home, the fatherland. The preservation of memory, it is a matter of life and death, not only for a single man, but for a whole nation, for a whole planet. Our memories makes us what we really are. They define us collectively as people having knowledge of our common history. The lotus eaters represent at least two states. The first one was the sweetness of the lotus fruits, which relates to the return of the energy that the companions lost. The recovery of this undistorted energy is represented by the arrival at the land of the lotus eaters, who, as Odysseus himself admitted, meant to do no harm to his companions. On the contrary, the lotus eaters offered them a taste of the fruits of consciousness. A consciousness now expanded by the death of the companions. The sense of the expanding consciousness is needed, is indeed very sweet, yet it possesses a hazard that relates to the ego's self-content and mental arrogance. Some individuals may remain stranded at this stage. It's very important. Feeling they have conquered knowledge. They have been spiritually awakened and are therefore successful and enlightened. They forget that the goal has not been reached yet. They have not reached Ithaca. We could therefore say that this is the narcissistic self-righteous behavior of the individuals who taste certain spiritual fruits and think they have reached the climax of spirituality. This is why they do not feel the need to return home. It is as if they are already there. Thankfully, Odysseus, who represents their waking consciousness, avoided this pitfall. The second meaning of the facts that unfold on the land of the Otus Lotus Eaters relates to the material world, the material life. We often say that life is sweet, much as the fruits of the lotus. However, life is given to us as an opportunity a starting point for our return to the spiritual life. And naturally, matter 
in itself is not sinful, nor does it mean to do us harm. Exactly as the lotus eater meant to do no harm to Odysseus and his companions. If they are harmed, if they become stranded, it is entirely their fault. The sweetness of the lotuses represent not only life's pleasure in this instance, but also the possibilities of awaking offered to us. Beauty and harmony in nature, books, art, spiritual schools and religion, religions are all lotuses. They are sweet. They aim to awaken us, not to keep us stranded in a state of languor and attachment to formalities. However, it does so happen that individual spiritual seekers or religious people get stuck on formalities, rituals, and automated mental activities. In all their love for formalities, they lose the essence. They have already forgotten about their return to Ithaca. They are hypnotized. They could worship a holy object, exhausting all the spiritual focus on it, rather than on the meaning it stands for. Sooner or later, though, as Homer informs us, they will be abducted and led by force, force towards their predetermined goal. The same holds true on the personal level. Seekers, much like Odysseus, having gone through a period of mental narcissism, whereupon they lose track of themselves, enjoying the spiritual abilities they have already conquered, these often make take the form of psychic abilities, such as, such as telepathy, predicting the future, telekinesis, and so on, or experiencing the attachment to matter or formalities and rituals of either spiritual or religious practice, and finally awakened by will or by force and continue on their journey. This journey will indeed lead to Ithaca, but only through the great adventure of self-discovery and internal cleansing, such as important cleansing is now at the gates. We are on the sign of Taurus, which symbolizes beauties and the pleasure of tranquil nature, ruler life, the traditional and idyllic aphrodisiac situations as the planet Venus rules this sign. It is also characterized by slow movements, the inertia stability. We see the comrades of Odysseus not wanting to leave the land of the Lotus Eater. The Taurus man is like a rock connected to the element of earth, which only by force can move. But the followers of Odysseus pass this ordeal. They endure the heavenly temptations of the land of Taurus and continue until the next zodiac phase. The sweet fruits that the lotus eaters and some of the companions tasted symbolize the lower earthly consciousness that numbs the soul. That is the higher spiritual forces making it forget the heavenly, its sunny homeland, which in myth is represented by Ithaca. Oblivion is a lethargy of her soul, and it is connected with a false world of unconsciousness and material comfort, where the soul is sedated, thus not being able to reach and remain in the truth. Some of Odysseus' companions did not pass this test, as the others did not pass the test of Aries with the Kikones before. They could not stand the temptation. Still others will fail successfully in the next trials until Odysseus will be left completely alone. The only one worthy to reach Ithaca, performing the difficult zodiacal zodiac path 
towards the sun, a course destined for him. Odysseus gathers his partners and departs. Then their next station is the island of Cyclops. There Odysseus leaves the rest of his partners, partners and with 12 men, he begins to explore the island. They find a cave full of milk and cheeses where a giant man lives with a single eye. His name is Polyphemus and he finds an opportunity to eat human flesh. He eats six men. Their first thought is to kill him and they cannot do it, but they will be buried because they will be buried alive inside the cave that the Cyclops seals with a huge stone. This puzzle is solved by Odysseus's wisdom. They get drunk, the Cyclops, with the wine that they have with them given to them by the priest Maron at the first adventure at Kikones, and they blind him. He is alive and can set aside the rock that closes the entrance of the cave, but at the same time, he is neutralized because he does not see them, and so they can escape. The night before, just before the Cyclops fell drunk, Polyphemus asked Odysseus what is his name was. He, in an outrage of intelligence, replied to him, nobody. But the next morning, after his triumph reveals his real name, if they ask you who has blind, tell them Odysseus did it. Then the Cyclops invokes his father Poseidon and he does everything to avenge the blindness of his son. Here we see another parallel with uh, the Jesus story. Jesus, um, um, behind Jesus is devil, behind Odysseus is Poseidon. The curse cannot work without knowing the real name. You are nobody, fame makes you somebody. Cyclops symbolizes the violent and passionate anger that exists within ourselves. For this reason, Homer presents him as a giant dark monster that lives in a cave, in other words, in the depths of, his, of our soul. Cyclops is a man eating being, eating people. Also anger is a soul eating emotion. In the end, it may destroy man himself. Cyclops do not have ships. They are not travelers. Anger is also an autistic emotion that makes you steady. Cyclopians, Cyclops do not plant trees because they do not possess fertile emotions. They do not recognize institutions. In the same way, anger does not recognize anybody else's right but his own. Furthermore, Cyclops has only one eye. The reason being that the, uh, that the feelings are lopsided and anger is completely one dimensional. Cyclops name is Polyphemus, meaning famous, world renowned and that is because anger shouts and screams his way around. Anger is not a feeling that can remain hidden forever. Odysseus does not kill Cyclops. Anger should not be buried. Man, out of his own nature at times, needs to complain or even explode, otherwise, is not a human being. I have to tell you now an important information about the difference between human and anthropos. The science that studies our species is called anthropology, not humanology. There is a big difference behind this. The word human 
comes from the Greek word homa, means soil, earth particle. So when somebody says, I'm a human, he refers to his earthly existence. Anthropos is somebody that he works with mental force. He is able to look up. He is able to understand the flow of divinity. And he is able to give therapy and therapy with his voice. Odysseus gets Cyclops drunk. And when he is still asleep and under the influence, then being brought into another mental situation. Odyssey is one more thing, is a complete description of the Neolithic time of period of man. Odysseus, he takes an olive stick, a big stick, and he blinds the eye of Polyphemus. You can imagine that the eye of Polyphemus may be like that or like that. Can you imagine how big a Mycenaean sword was very big and very sharp. If you put a Mycenaean sword into an eye, you will get him blinded. But why he uses the stick? Here, Homer gives us more details about the Neolithic hunter period of the world. The Odyssey in the Iliad is full of descriptions of Neolithic time period situations. Odysseus pierces his, pierces his eye with a large stick. Homer calls this stick the pole mochlon, a word which has the same root as mochthon, meaning the great effort. Also, he uses the word ropalon. This is also a term which sheds light on a certain symbolism. Ropalon symbolizes philosophy which encourages, embraces words that must become sharp, acute, and burning, and being about the elimination of such a disastrous feeling. Eropalon is also being held by Hercules. The Ropalon means also the philosophical word, and it comes from an olive tree. Olive trees are associated with Athena. In order for Odysseus to achieve his goals, he must become nobody. That translates into the idea that man has to rid himself or undress himself from his audacity in order to tam the beast of anger that lies within himself. We are the kingdom of Poseidon, which is the water of all species, and it is interested in the, their continuous recycling. Philosophically, he deals with the forced recycling of bodies, from which one comes out only as one has thought of things outside of circular cave, such as Odysseus. The Cyclops is the one who allows the cycle of rebirths. Cyclops symbolizes the cycle of rebirths until we have the right capacity to overcome the cave that is actually the womb, the matrix. The adventure with the Cyclops Polyphemus corresponds to the heavens with the constellation Gemini. Odysseus, with 12 selected warriors, goes to explore in the country of Cyclops, leaving behind the coast ships, the ships and other companions. This separation of the crew in both gives us the first element of the dualism that characterizes Gemini. Odysseus split his companions equally. Inside cave of Cyclops, where the Greeks were captured, 
there are other indicative and interesting facts, facts that revealed the effect of this zodiac sign. Before the huge giant, before the huge giant notices them with the one eye on the forehead, does various jobs. He milks the goats and divides their milk into two equal parts. After receiving information from Odysseus about their presence there, grabs two companions and with a horrible way devours them. He will repeat this act two more times. Also, Odysseus, to overcome this ordeal, uses two names, one false, nobody, and the other, his true name, Odysseus. As with Gemini, one of whom is mortal and the other immortal. Odysseus manages with deceit to blight Polyphemus and save his companions. Achieved to get out of the cave guarding the angry and blinded, blinded monster, hidden and hang under the thick haired belly of the animals of Cyclops' flock. Its mate needs two animals on sides to support and save guards. Odysseus uses only one from his belly of which it hangs. The air element that governs the two worlds is presented here with the act of the exit to the light, hanging suspended in the air by the wool of the goats that symbolizing light and fire. And from this ordeal, few come out victorious. The next island is a bronze palace. There, Aeolus, keeper of the wings, lives with his 12 children. Odysseus and his companions moved away from Cyclops and continue on their journey. Now, their sea quest leads them to Aeolia, the floating island of Aeolus, the guardian of the winds. He has 12 children, six sons and six daughters. He had married his children with each other and they all lived happily together. Aeolus welcomes the travelers and gladly offers them hospitality for 30 days. Aeolus' 12 children represent the balance between yin and yang. In Greek, it's called harmonia, harmony. Male and female, as well as the balance between the two cere cerebral lobes. Why do we speak of balance? Because Homer text mentions that they all lived happily. Therefore, this is not a case of incest, but a kind of kindred complement, much as that of the cranial nerves of the two lobes. In the continuation of my presentation, I will go more details about the, 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 the genetic knowledge of Homer of the function of the brains. It is also worth noting that the island itself, Aeolia, is floating like our brain. The stem of the Greek word aeol, where aeolus and aeolia derive from, relates to the movement, fast and effortless, effort, effortless motion and diversity. Indeed, these properties describe the mind, which drifts quickly and wanders towards various different directions. The floating island itself reminds us of the same thing 
since it is here on one moment and somewhere else the next. So does Aeolus power. Since he is the guardian of the winds, because winds are also related to the mental field. Ultimately, ultimately, all the above refer, refer to a mental psychological state that I will analyze now. Odysseus, the seeker, reaches this state after having beaten his inner Polythemus, he has now set his mind in order. And so he is able to meet Aeolus, who controls the winds, or otherwise his thoughts. And Aeolus is friendly and willing to help. He is excited by the story of Odysseus and makes him grace to tie all the other winds in a pouch and to let free the west wind. So the tired man sees the land of Ithaca from a far away. Odysseus makes the mistake to sleep. His partners, thinking that there are riches in the bag and wealth, open the bag and storms emerges. They return to the island of Aeolus. He pulls away Odysseus as the gods hated. This is another example of the story of Jesus and Odysseus in an opposite form. Jesus asked his companions not to sleep and now Odysseus did the same. It's full of these symbolisms. On the island of Aeolus, Odysseus and his men are entering the kingdom of self-reliance, which it is also complete that needs no outside help. Aeolus becomes the recipient of the winds. In other words, he controls the circumstances. He manages to tie up all winds inside a bag and leaves free only the west wind who blows and carries the ship all the way to Ithaca. In another symbolism, the west wind, it's the return from the south current in Atlantic Ocean. This is, symbolizes a map how to take the lower, the south current to return back to Europe. This is another thing. Just a short step before achieving his goal, Odysseus sees from distance his fatherland and thinking that his adventures ended, he fell into sleep. This means that our conscious, the captain of our ship and our life, sees to be vigilant and becomes inactive. Right at this moment, his men, symbols of lower self, take the opportunity to undermine us. They see Aeolus bag and they think that this is where hides, where there is the treasures. They open it up and right from within, winds blow up and pull the ship back to the open seas. Sometimes our journey seems easy and our goal quite achievable. Our tailwinds seems to work like a, like a compromise of opposite forces. And we think mistakenly that everything has been done due to our personal capabilities. Success becomes a bad teacher because it pampers the disciple but does not teach him. Victory is denied at the last minute for you have acted like a winner ahead of your time. Odysseus was, was at a mental and a psychological state which allowed him to control his thoughts, a state symbolized by the entrapped winds. Only the west wind, a friendly and favorable wind was left free, representing the thoughts which are directly related to the goal. Thus, nine days passed. 
in the Pythagorean numerology. Nine is this number of completeness, a cycle that was completed and Ithaca was now very close. This is what, this was the exact moment Odysseus let down his alertness and allow himself to drift off to sleep. In the previous Rhapsody, we had seen that victory against one part of the self, Polyphemus, will lead to a great opportunity, to Aeolus. Yet, total alertness is required so that the opportunity is not missed. We are often tested in the exact same matter. Even in our everyday life, we often set a target. We fight hard for it. And when the outcome comes, we are pursuing to appear, to, sorry. We are tempted to lessen our efforts, taking for granted the achievements of our goal. Yet, this is precisely the moment when we need to double our efforts our, and maintain complete concentration and alertness. Because the dreadful companions are lurking inside us, these are the parts of the ego which will divert us from our goal if we even momentarily dim our alertness. Odysseus will now lead, have to take the long way back to Ithaca. But what causes such reminiscence? Remis, remiscence? The secret lies in Polyphemus curses, which suggest the unfinished business Odysseus had with him. They are loose ends, which requires emotional cleansing. Is it possible to, to close the microphone because it dis distracts me? Um, yeah, I, uh, I should put some people, yeah, I'll, I'll put other people on mute. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, um, Janice, you'll have to um, un unmute. I, I should put myself on mute after you've. It's okay now. On an esoteric level, the waters upon which Poseidon rules, Poseidon, Polyphemus' father, are related to emotion. While the winds upon which Aeolus rules are related to mentality. Yet, Odysseus' psyche, the seeker's psyche, was still unprepared to reach the end of the journey. And even though he briefly tasted the joys of return and could gaze at the coveted homeland from afar, he had many more experiences to live through until he could cleanse his subconscious, rule over his emotions, and once again face prepared this time the field of clear intellect represented by the Theasians, the ones who will give him a second chance to return to Ithaca. In the meantime, Odysseus continued recounting his adventures. The floating island, island of Aeolus is the symbol of the ship of the moon floating in the sky, closely associated with a sign of cancer, as long as its ruler is the moon. King Aeolus and his family host Odysseus and his companions from one full moon to another. That is one month when the tired warriors rest and enjoy the joys of the royal generosity of Aeolus. The royal family consists of 14 members, their parents, 
six boys and six daughters who identify with us a basic lunar circle of 14 days that is from a new moon to the full moon. For nine days and nights, the 10th, when the homeland was visible, the comrades opened the bag and caused a terrible windstorm that brought them back to Aeolus. This back and forth route is associated with the crab movement and symbolizes the zodiac cancer that is this journey. After days of wandering, there is another devastation in the country of the Lestrigonians, the cannibalistic Lestrigonians. This picture is uh, a way to describe the cosmic phenomenon of the tale of Lestrigonians. The word itself describes actually much of this picture. Odysseus recounts how they left Aeolia, set sail in the ocean, and after a six day journey, arrived at Telepilos, the land of the Lestrigons, where the path of day is near the path of night. Odysseus sends three of his companions to find out which land they have arrived at. They reach the city, enter the palace, and see a huge woman, tall as a mountain. As soon as she, they seize, as, as soon as, as this woman sees them, she starts screaming. Her husband, Andifatis, appears. In an instant, he grabs one of the men and devours him. The other two start running, returning to the ships. But Antifatids alerts the, less, the others of the Lestrigons who start swarming from all directions in thousands and are all huge. Aggravated as they are, they run for the shore, grab huge rocks, and threw them at the ships, smashing them one by one and snatching the men to eat them. Odysseus, seeing this havoc, cuts the coltrads of the ship and sets off, saving himself in the nick of time. So the rest of the ships are lost and only one remains. What happened in Telepilos was a kind of natural consequence of retrib retribution for the heedless, heed heedlessness of Odysseus' companions. They harvested the fruits of their senseless, excuse me, from the last regions. It all unfolded in the distant Telepilos, the remote gateway where the cannibalistic giants live. Their leader was Andifates. The Lastrigons served one purpose. They ate people and consequently they destroyed everything that belonged not to a divine state, but to a human mortal state, which in this case was another form of ego. Therefore, anything perishable was gradually lost and all that was left was spiritual. However, this, pro this process will be gradually completed as Odysseus went through consecutive adventures, which in essence were rituals of initiation. For the time being, he lost all his men and he was left with only one ship and the companions on board. The rest of his companions were not be able to escape. They were eaten by the Lestrigons. Their deeds were the cause of their misfortune, since no matter what, 
they could not have returned to Ithaca. They were not worthy of returning to Ithaca. This is why, even though the ships were approaching Ithaca, the companions themselves became the reason why they strayed from it once more since they released the winds of Aeolus. If we take Ithaca to be the kingdom of the heavens, then Odysseus' dreadful companions cannot enter the kingdom of heavens. In other words, the ego cannot enter the kingdom of heavens. They will perish in a remote land, Telepilos, which could relate to the earthly field where the ego is consumed and trans, transbastiated, thereby releasing the energy it possesses. In the end, only the awakening consciousness, Odysseus, and the sub-personalities or parts of the self directly associated with it may be saved and set off to face yet another challenge, the one represented, represented by Circe. Associated with the sign of Leo, it is the adventure with the last regions. Back to this fire sign, will happen a great battle, a war conflict, like the one with the Kikones in the beginning with Aries. You see how meticulous Homer is, which the hero can only partially avoid. Only Odysseus' ship will be saved. He will uh, have to wait until Sagittarius with Scylla and Charybdis to see him escape the conflict and pass the ship intact despite the inve ine inevitable price of doom of six companions. When they reach the port, surrounded by huge rocks, all the ships enter without exception, except for Odysseus, who lives out on the rope tying the ropes to the stone, as it's he something felt, something is gonna happen here. The element of provision is characteristic of him and the sign of Leo. And here it is presented intensely. Intensely. The king of the last Trigon, Antifates, represents the negative elements of Leo that the hero will must avoid and overcome. After the only one remain after Odysseus reaches the island of the witch Circe, Odysseus sends an identification team, but the men are transformed into pigs. Odysseus then goes to find Circe, but on roots close to the palace of Circe, he meets Hermes. Hermes gives him the molly which is an antidote to witches' spells. Cersei fails to make him a pig, and after that, she becomes his guide and helper in the adventures that follow. Cersei means circle. According to Neoplatonic philosophers, Cerse symbolizes the circles and the return to reincarnation. The seven chakras and the Odysseus journey. The word chakra is Sanskrit and means will, suggesting spinning energy. It also the word Cerse comes from the Greek word Krikos means the same thing, ring. In Homer's time, the word is encountered as kirkos, where the word Cersei comes. A chakra, therefore, describes something round, like a wheel. From the word kirkos derives the word circuit, circumference, circulation, 
and circus, all of them related to the word cycle. A similar concept is encountered in Plato's Timaeus, where the body and soul of the world are described. I'm gonna to explain to you now how the platonic, how, um, what is the perception and the incarnation project process according to Plato. And this information is behind the curtain, behind the curtain of Plato's work. According to platonic description, the creator gave the soul seven different rotations and circles. Three of these circles rotate at equal speed, while all the rest rotate at unequal speeds each. This rotation may also refer to the quality of the first four chakras, which start at the base of the spine and reach up to the chest, the area of the body where the mortal part of the soul inhabits. According to Plato, the rotating cycles, its, its and its own pace may be called unbalanced. The three higher chakras from the throat to the head correspond to the body area where Plato places the immortal part of the soul where Zeus lives. In a while, I'm gonna to explain to you also uh, how uh, Greeks gave some meditational process to be able to access some parts of the brain. Cersei offers a drink to the disciples, to the companions of Odysseus called Kikeon. All the names, the important names, has one more element, the letter N. The letter N in the Pythagorean transcendental understanding, it is law and mind. Words that have inside them the letter N symbolizes mind, knowledge, know. The Neoplatonist philosophers called our planet the home of Cersei, where souls having drunk from the cocktail of Cersei becomes possessed and the end result is forgetfulness, deception, ignorance. The drink transforms Odysseus men into pigs. Every transformation is allegorical. It does not mean that they were literally turned into pigs, but their lives became more animal-like. Odysseus and his companions with their ship reach the shores of Cersei and explore the island. They split themselves into two groups of 23 men. Why? This why we learn that the passengers of the ship were 46. 46 are the pillars of the Parthenon. Parthe non, the theory mind. Our bodies also consist of 46 chromosomes. It seems like Cersei possesses methods of genetic modification. Homer's Odyssey and Iliad is full of uh, information that now has been confirmed by modern science. I will give you just some examples because it's a topic of another conversation and I hope I'm not tiring you. We all know that the symbol of Hermes, the god that is present in the story, is present in the story of Circe, is the Cadicus. 
Hermes assisted Odysseus. There is a protein in our body, protein, that is called laminin, or otherwise messenger, because it transmits messages from one cell to another. All the names of the Olympians and mythology corresponds to deep knowledge, deep knowledge of uh, anatomy and mor molecular biology. Mythology is full of such codified references. When we have numbers in mythology, we are dealing with multiple natural phenomena. Homer also said that Circe has four maids who were born out of fountains and sacred rivers. Those maids could be the basis of our DNA nucleotides. I will explain to you also the knowledge of Homer about the DNA structure. Furthermore, Homer being a natural philosopher way before Thales comes to the conclusion that water is our first cause and calls the ocean the birth source of everything. Odysseus is the only one who drank Circe's drink from the golden cup, but he was not turned into an animal. Pra because prior to this, he met God Hermes, the Logos, who gives an antidote called Molly to be able to make the transmission easier. This is explained by Proclus, again, in a codified way that I'm going to analyze you now. We should not be surprised that is this life that in this life some are turned into wolves, pigs, or any other species. We should not be surprised that some souls in the face of any diversity remain calm, such as Odysseus. These souls are similar to the nature of Hermes and strive towards the logos, word, and wisdom. In a little while, I'm going to show you some more explanations about the connections it's been unveiled in Homer's Odyssey. This is Circe. Circe transformed Odysseus' men into human, only to make them more handsome, taller, younger. In other words, they have evolved. Circe helps to develop the lower and immature elements of Odysseus. By the same token, through, she evolves herself. Um, inside, in uh, Homer's Odyssey, there's references that I'm going to speak to you also, give you some information about the specific meditational process that creates vice versa aging. The up to now, the, respectful, the respectable mistress of the beasts comes to the man for the first time. While in the beginning there was a certain animosity, later on she becomes a guide and a mystic. She advises Odysseus on how he can cross down to the underworld and to do it unscathed from areas where danger, evil, supernatural forces are hiding. Sexual energy is extremely powerful force. Cersei represented, represents that force. If it is tamped, it can elevate the consciousness into higher spheres. That's the word, that's why the word idoni, hedonistic, evolves the letter N. However, if it dominates overwhelmingly, it leads to an animalistic attachment to the human body, not because it entails something evil, but because it drags the mind into the physical dimension alone, thus making to forget the spiritual one. So Cersei turned men into beasts, and at the same time, she dominated them. Iliad is the patriarchy. The Odyssey 
is the representation of the matriarchy. Everything in uh, Greek philosophy has to do with the vibration of the opposites. This is a representation of the mistress of the animals from my known time period. We are in the sign of Virgo and Cersei has the characteristic of an ancient lunar goddess, Artemis. The sign is associated with the element Earth, which represented by the pig symbol and laziness. The drinks and the feasts of the traditional type, the joys and pleasures, which on a smaller scale we made in the previous sign of Earth, Taurus, with the lotus eater, with the lotus eaters. In the end, they crave the homeland and prepare the trip for the consent with the consent of her. But she advises them and reveals them the next test, the descent to Hades, which corresponds to Libra, where the past will be weighted and the future to be prophesied by prophet Theresias. Now everything begins. Right at the heart of the Odyssey, there lies the most mysterious incident, Odysseus' descent to Hades. There is a major crossing point in the story of the hero, wherever that might be. Odysseus follows Circe's instructions and with his ship reaches the limits of the world of senses. It's pure meditational processes right now. Through the fog and darkness digs a deep trench, sacrifices a black ship and calls for the soul of the dead prophet Tiresias who retains his psychic capabilities even after his death. Tiresias is blind. He became blind because he had the audacity to stare goddess of wisdom, Athena, naked. The myth couldn't have been more revealing in his own lesson. Tiresias looked at the naked truth and knowledge themselves. The name Tiresias means one who studies the stars. Divination is a vision achieved by introspection of the imaginary world in which future events exist like a seed. According to Laplace, we must see the present state of the universe as the result of the past and the cause of it that will follow in the future. An intellect that at some point could know all the forces that move the creature and the position of beings. Would be able to know both the movements of the larger celestial bodies and the smaller ones. For this intellect, nothing would be uncertain. The future, like the past, would be the present before her. In a platonic dialogue called Theaetitus, Plato puts his teacher Socrates in a meditational state. And in this meditational state, he, de he describes the earth from above. In 1959, astronomers uh, said that the Homeric test is accurate, that uh, actually this is what you see when you are in the stratosphere. Odysseus, from that point then on, he did not need conventional vision. Now we're go going internal because he had acquired the esoteric spiritual vision with which he preserves the mysteries of life and death. Like Jesus, Odysseus goes to the underworld and in three days 
he returns. The mysteries of past as well the future. The same implies with Homer's blindness. Also Homer, he was blind. He was not blind. He was seen with his inside spiritual eye. When uh, these ancient philosophers was able to crack the spiritual eye, then they didn't need any conventional vision and as they describe it, achieved immortality. I will tell you how this happens later. How this happens, how they did it, you know, it's a process. Man seeks eagerly the knowledge of the future, but in order for this to take place, one needs to capture the knowledge of the past. If one truly wants to be able to live in the present and advances the higher level man. Firstly, he has to comprehend his past. He needs to clean it up, to define it, and finally to purge it. Everything has that happened in the present has its roost, roots and it causes in the past. Odysseus descends to Hades. I would like to remind you that Odysseus is the path of essence. But why he does that? He needs to go through this ordeal to find his island. Odysseus is the best sailor in the world. As long as he, as he looks at the sky, he can, he is able to coordinate himself to find Ithaca. But Odysseus is not looking to find an island. But why he's doing that? He needs to go th th through this ordeal to find his island. Odysseus is not looking to find an island. In the name Ithaca is found the word ethics, is an anagram. And he has to make a transcendental mental descent into the depths of his unconscious. There are specific meditation methods developed by the ancient Greeks. Odysseus descends into Hades in order to get in touch with his past. I told you in the beginning that the world is based on three, Zeus, Poseidon, our world, and Hades. Hades is the real of the unconscious that you enter it only through meditation process. All the knowledge exists on that level. Tiresias reveals to him the causes of his wanderings. On his way, through comes across the deceased mothers of great heroes, as well his own mother, who has passed away. In the meantime, he learns from her what awaits for him in Ithaca. The end result is the expansion of his consciousness and a completely new vision of his own life history. From then on, he knows his tasks. He remembered all of his past lives. Following that advice of Circe, Odysseus arrived in an unknown time where the deep ocean ends in the land of the Chimerians, which is covered with darkness and clouds to those who live in a permanent winter, in a land that is shady, swamps, and dense forest everywhere. Swamp in Greek language is valtos. How do you call the land of the swamps, of the swamps? Baltic. These descriptions are on the verge of fantasy and reality. It is not necessarily a completely fantastic country. The poet simply uses some deeper knowledge of his time and adorns the country of Hades with the corresponding characteristics of a cold, extreme northern country, the Hyperboreans something we saw at the beginning of the presentation with the Greek toponyms in Norway. We are now in Libra. The element of air that governs the sign of Libra is strongly present in this gaseous 
shadows of the dead that are lost and sell in the air as if they were swept away by gloomy winds. Cersei sends Odysseus to the underworld where he founds the prophet Tiresias, the only one who can explain why he cannot go home and what he has to do. Cersei also instructs him to safely cross the sirens. He must tie himself to the ship's mast and that he can hear their song without being able to go near them. He still has to block the ears of his companions with beeswax so that they cannot hear the tempting and deadly song. Only in this way they are saved. Sirens. Their name means, in a sense, I knit nets, traps, and I sing. The siren. In a cold and transcendental sense, it means the inner flow of mentality. Every word in Greek language that has R signifies flow. And not only Greek, in another language also fire, river, current. The siren, the sirens does not eat you, but captivated by their song, you forgot to eat and drink and you die of starvation. You forget your material needs. The Odyssey has this future that we see in many episodes. As in the Lotus Eaters, the human mind must not lose its memory, its purpose in life to be left in oblivion to the pleasures of either the mind or the flesh. The measures of excellence is ubiquitous throughout the epic. The Odyssey asks us to keep a measure on our, all, on our mental concerns and physical needs does not ask us to deprive them. Sirens possesses the knowledge. That's why they alone recognize Odysseus and call him with his name. They tell him, we know everything. In modern terms, that would mean as if someone had access to a complete global software. In spite of all this, the shores of the island of the Sirens are full of piles and bones that rot. Of those who did not succeed to integrate and absorb this fatal and burning truth. I call it burning because that's why the name Siren also means, is connected to the star of Sirius. The sirens belong to the jurisdiction of Poseidon connected to the water element. As we said in the beginning, Poseidon is considered the god of charm and frustration, but also the god of ideal and dreams. It seems like the mythologist, they had, as from my understand from my own uh, research, they had the specific equations that they were using these symbols and through poetry they were altering the symbols and they were able to create new stories based on the already existing one. Uh, it's totally remarkable the capacity of that mentality Odysseus is forced to fill his companion's ear with wax. They are not in a position to hear. They are not ready. I have to remind you that it was them who were transformed into pigs. The only one who is ready to take hold of this knowledge that has been provided by the sirens is Odysseus. Even for him, there is a condition attached. He must be standing up and tied it to the mast of the ship.
we are here we are given the picture of Scorpio zodiac that is a land amphibian such as sirens that while having winds do not fly and stay sitting in the aquatic environment waiting passively their victims. There are two horrible pitfalls in their way, Scylla and Charybdis. The first is a six-headed monster. It grabs six men, the others roam fast to escape. The second is a huge vortex. It absorbs the water and then rinses it again, rowing through the escape. Scylla is a multi-headed eating monster. In philosophical terms, it can represent the force that takes away from man and his beloved one. It can be death, migration to a foreign land or any, particu or any particular loss. To such a loss that takes away a piece of one's life, man is completely defenseless. Stay away from Scylla. She is immortal and she ate six men. Odysseus must be prepared to lose six men in order to save the rest. Men may lose occasionally, figuratively, but at times literally. The issue is to remain stuck, not to remain stuck while trying to resist. Charivdis has nothing human about her. She is not even a monster. She is a swirl, a horrible force that absorbs and takes everything inside her. Three times a day, she was swallowing a large quantity of seawater together with anything that was floating. And three times she was blasting it out, completely destroyed. Odysseus passes Charivdis twice. He's left alone. Everybody dies in Charivdis. The element of fire is associated with Sagittarius. Here we see Odysseus reaching for conflict, for battle, as befights these elements as we saw before. Odysseus avoids it wisely. With the higher fire of Sagittarius wisdom, through pays the heavy price of loss of six comrades, and then all. Odysseus goes to the island of the sun. Cersei has warned them not to touch the oxen but graze free, that graze freely on the island. However, Odysseus' companions cannot resist. The only one who does not eat the oxen is Odysseus. They pay the price. They return back to Charybdis. They all die. The oxen of the sun, those animals, has a great, is a, creates a great puzzle for the observer. How come their total number always remain the same? They symbol, they are, they symbolizes the voice of the sun, the voice of the sun that enlightens the mind. If you see knowledge in front of you, you may want to eat them all, but you will not be able to digest it. Only Odysseus is being saved by Charybdis and by the punishment to eat the oxen of the bull. He holds on the mast of the ship. The mast symbolizes the values, the center, the spiritual advancement. Naked, the waves throw Odysseus in Ogygia, the land of Calypso. After wandering for nine days at sea, caught by planks, escaping death again, 
from a horrible horrendous Odysseus exhausted arrives alone at the island of Calypso Ogygia she lives with her for seven years a whole life circle but he never forgets his homeland in Ithaca and the one thing he only wants is to return to his wife Penelope and his son he left when he was a little boy when he went to the Trojan War Calypso proposed him to stay with her forever and she has the power to make him immortal but she is not capable of tending, tempting his soul that wishes Nostos the return. God Hermes arrives in Ogygia, announcing the command of the Olympian gods to Calypso to allow Odysseus to live. He gathers some woods, cuts them, he makes a boat, he makes a raft, raft and returns back into the sea. Calypso is the covering one, she covers up Odysseus and nobody knows whether he is alive or dead. On the island of Ogygia, Odysseus stays for seven years. This is the longest time of his decade long wandering. He remains stuck. Seven is a peculiar number. It is the only number between zero and 10, which neither divided nor multiplied. It's static like Odysseus life at this point. The word seven or hepta, hepta in Greek, it means the divine, the respectful. It is not coincidence that seven are the wise men in antiquity. Rome is surrounded by seven hills. Seven are the colors of Iris. Seven, the tones of music scale. Man changes his outlook, life every seven years and human cells renew themselves within the body in this time period. Every time we have a genetic modification, Hermes intervenes as in Circe. Calypso comes to Odysseus bringing the ultimate temptation, immortality and eternal youth. If he agrees and stays with her, he will keep him always young and immortal forever. Yet Odysseus chooses to return to his homeland and his beloved Penelope. Man must decide what his goals in life are. Saved from the waters as if it's resurrected from the sea that baptized him after the symbolic second death within the liquid element, Odysseus is treated by Calypso, the beautiful goddess. This is where Odysseus stops recounting his adventures that led him to the palace of Alcinous. From there, we had started the analysis of zodiac symbols of the mythical initiation journey of this solar hero. Odysseus has left the island of the sun and continues his wandering. Poseidon sees him at a distance and unleashes a storm against him. Lefkothea, a sea goddess, saves him from the waves. The daughter of the king of Phaeacians, Nafsika, find him naked. Those seeking the truth will never find it if they have a clear preconception of what the truth should be. Whoever seeks the truth must lose everything so as to gain everything. Yet this condition is rarely perceived. Phaeacians is civilized and noble people who are expert in shipping. Their ships travel everywhere safely without ruders, ordn, and captains. The navigation commands are received telepathetically by the boat and the passengers are asleep during the voyage. Here we have a reference of an artificial technology ship that it moves only with telepathy and uh, knows all the depths and the expansion of the universe. And when you travel in that ship, you must sleep because obviously the trip is long. We've seen some 
movies like Avatar that is something like that. They therefore sent him to Ithaca. They leave him on a remote coast of his island and there comes the goddess Athena. The situation in Ithaca is not at all pleasant. The land of the Phaeacians is the 12th stop in Odysseus way. Phaeacians are civilized nation and an evolved one. They welcome him warmly and let him rest, relax, and also entertain himself for a while after wondering how you got here, a mortal's foot cannot step on that place. They told him that how you came to us if a mortal can come to, cannot come to us. Who are they? There Odysseus takes the opportunity to collect his thoughts and remembers. Within the palace of Alkinos, the power mind, Alkinos is the power mind, he who has a robust and strong mind, and Queen Ariti, the virtue of implicit meaning. Filled with joy and such a well-intentioned mood, where Dimodokos, the singer, begins to sing the lyrics about Trojan War, Odysseus starts crying. Phaeacians, at that point, shows modern psychology. They listen with great attention and he himself talks and weeps and aches once again for all the torture that he went through. It was an emotional cleansing. All of this in the end becomes an emotional cleansing. Phaeacians are the help that we perceive at some point in our life. From the heart of Pisces, then to his palace of Alkinos, Odysseus, winner of all his trials of his journey, will arrive initiated in Ithaca as the only one worthy claimant to the throne and queen Penelope. This is the third in labor in the center of the labyrinth, in the solar center of zodiac wheel. Phaeacians. Thea. Usia, Thea, Usia, is the gray matter. Gray matter is a major component of the central nervous system. Odysseus has left the island of the sun and continues his wanderings. Poseidon sees him at a distance and unleashes a storm against him. Lefkothea, a sea goddess, saves him from the waves. Lefko in Greek is the white. Thea is the view, the one that he's able to access the white view. White matter refers to areas of the central nervous system, CNS, that are mainly made up of myelinated axons, also called trust. Long through to be passive tissue, white matter affects learning and brain functions, modulating the distribution of action potentials, acting as relay and coordinating communications between different brain regions. Telemachus is the son of Odysseus. His father is missing. He goes around to find him. The bond that Telemachus has with his father has been described the bond of all bonds. What is this bond that Telemachus has with his father? Here I will emphasize something about Telemachus. Telemachus is the one that he fights from far away. Tile in Greek language is far away. Telephone, telekinesis, telepathy. Wherever we see the tile, it's far away and something else. Telemachus, he's fighting from far away. Who is now him? Here I want to emphasize something about Telemachus. The Greeks had developed a complete meditation system, structure in logical order and development. Through this meditative method, 
they could enter a cognitive state and had access to a database which is inherited in the genetic structure of men and according to the tradition was given by Zeus and Athena in a helical form with the name Helix. Estelemachus is the telecommuter, is the one who fights from afar and who gives instructions from afar. Which battle and which instructions does it refer to? Telemachus, the one who fights spiritually, meditating, the gift given by Zeus to man, the need for him not to do anything excessive in the matter of receiving sacred knowledge from the invisible helix. Telemachus, the one who spiritually from afar fights and hears the divine word of Zeus in his mind, which is transmitted by the electromagnetic waves. Earth, Telemachus, is equipped with state-of-the-art scientific knowledge from the helix genes with the electromagnetic waves, the seven messengers, helix DNA 34A. What I just read to you, it was from the, from the research of the anagram of the Odyssey. This is the meaning that comes out. Only moral minds had access to the meditative method and to this database where the secret of immortality is revealed to them. The last three years, 81 young kings asked Penelope to choose one of them and her new husband. They spend their time in endless feasts and destroy the fortune of Odysseus. No one is able to put an end on this waste. Now things became worse. Odysseus, he arrives in Ithaca. He's searching for allies. He finds them in the faces of the faithful, the shepherds of Evmeos and Philetius. Meanwhile, Telemachus returns. He reveals his plan to kill the suitors. Odysseus arrives disguised as a beggar in his own palace and looks at the area and the suitors. They continue to entertain and reveal the worst self. He also meets Penelope and finds her sincere attitude, but she is also in despair. Everything is ready. He commands his associate and pretext to remove the weapons from the palace so that the suitors have no way of defending themselves. Then he brings the old bow of Odysseus. They put 12 pairs of mattocks in a row and compete. Who will be able to pass an arrow through their holes? The suitors are waiting to fool him after his failure, but they are surprised to see the old beggar bend the bow with craft and the arrow that throws finds his goal. Only the next goal of what they thought as a beggar is the leader of the suitors, one after the other falls dead. Odysseus reveals his true identity to Penelope and leaves to meet his father, Laertes. Who, is, who lives isolated and immersed in despair for his son who thinks he's dead. He finds him and gives him the joy that he sees to hope. Odysseus, he wants to remember Everything in the home. Homer is an excellent connoisseur of mathematics with a particular favor in number three, as you saw. In both the Iliad and the Odyssey, he uses in this reference remarkable numbers from one to nine and their multiples, while the same, the measure of the verses is inspired by harmony, reminiscent of Pythag Pythagorean mathematical models. And why? What is this obsession? with 369 that Nikola Tesla also told us. Both the Iliad and the Odyssey begin with the invocation of the muse, the memory. Plato told us that knowledge is remembrance. 
Who gave the tools of remembrance? The mother of the muses is mnemosine, the remembrance. Who gave to us, to our humans, the tools to remember? In the tragedy of Aeschylus, Prometheus bound in a work which Aeschylus was accused of revealing secrets of LFCs, scientific knowledge that was forbidden to be revealed to the initiated, there is the following excerpt. Until I saw the signings of the stars and settings hard to recognize, and I found numbers for them, chief advice of all, groupings of letters, memories handmade that, and mother of the muses. The mother of the muses is mnemosine, remembrance. The Greek language is the most perfect that has been created in the annals of human history. It is a language constructed in such a way as to be directly related to mathematical language as to enclose an invisible harmony and as the Amplichus wrote on theologians of arithmetic. Each word corresponds to a number. As an example, we will take the word Omicron. Omicron is the O, that is the number 50. So 70 plus 40 plus 10 plus 100 plus 70 and plus 50, the word Omicron has a result of 360. These people that they found the word to, to correspond to Omicron, they found a word that correspond to the circle. The one digit number that we finally get from the sum of the numbers of the lexicon of a word is called bottom lexicon. It means 360, three plus nine, three plus six, nine. Let us look at the epic of the Odyssey by making an attempt to decode the first four words of the first rhapsody. This now is again from this sacred analysis of the Odyssey. The first four words of the Odyssey is Andra mi enepe musa. O muse, tell me about the man. The word Andra, based on that, is this. And the bottom lexicon is that 156, 1 plus 5, 6, 3. He, the identities of the four lexicons give us a world first of the golden number, the sequence of in, in dangers, Fibonacci series, that is on the basis of which our genetic code, code structures of human body, Zeus, Helix, and not only. In other words, we have the unique sequence of the natural numbers, 3369, in the two Homeric epics. All the epics is based on this sequence. It's amazing what they've done. Six in mathematics, in the Pythagorean mathematics, is the perfect number. Uh, that is the sum of, of its factors since it solves six, uh, one plus two plus three, also six multiply one, multiply two, multiply three. On the other hand, nine, is a number of completions since, since in nine closes a circle of numbers and begins another as its name suggests, Ennea. The name Ennea consists of two words, Enon and Neon, old and new. In the Odyssey, Six are the companions of Odysseus who are killed by each ship in the ordeal of the Kikones. Six are eaten by the Cyclops and six by the Scylla. Six, 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 six. What is this six, six, six? Twelve, the ships of Odysseus symbolizing the aspects of the psyche. The fact that there are six comrades who are killed indicates the perfection of this aspect of psyche in this particular challenge. The 12 ships of Odysseus 
On the other hand, symbolizes the incarnation in the whole zodiac circle from which the soul must pass. Just like the son of justice, Odysseus returns shining to his throne and his people conscious. All this take place on the day of Apollo feast. Penelope is not only a lady, she is an idea. That's why she lives high up on the altar. Homer says that she possesses unusual spiritual strength. She is the archetype of dedication. Her name means the duck, a duck, and revered and divine goddess. And not just any kind of duck, but a specific duck that is monogamic. Here we see the oldest depiction of a human-like god in the world. It is from Akrotiri Sandorini, where I live. According to the archaeologists, is the oldest depiction of a god that looks like a human as its own image in the world. Is the goddess Potnia, the goddess Earth. Let's admire the beauty of the matriarch society of the Minoan civilization. Let's look at her neck. Do you see the ducks? Penelope is her. She's a divine goddess. Everything in, uh, in Odyssey is a con natural continuation of the Minoan matriarch civilization that never left the conscience of the Greeks. Always the Greeks had the women around them. Until today in Sandorini, on the churches, on the Christian churches, they are full of Minoan symbols. To a transcendental degree, Penelope is the solar ratio that moves as a coil. Penelope is an electric generator of, of cosmic currents, which converts the electric field into magnetism. We would say that the Penelope soul functions as a coil, because her name means that, Pineon, which leaks from the flow of the divine substance, cosmic energy of the cosmic law, which runs through the whole universe and turns into the iron race of people in which it manifests intense magnetism, attraction to the conceivable, resulting in the development of the divine love with upper realms. She is the archetype of dedication. Despite of 20 years of waiting and the lack of any information regarding Odysseus whereabouts, she still believes that her husband is alive and one day he will return. Penelope has many talents and skill, wise thinking, alertness, combined with great dexterity, the mastermind. She waves every day in her loom and in the night. She destroys that again. This is the life of the shooters. Penelope is essentially the weaver of the epic. Even the name Penelope refers to weaving. Pineon in ancient Greek is the pulley in which the thread goes around it. In conclusion, the Odyssey is the description of the course of exposure of the mind, trials of Odysseus until he reaches to Phaeacians, an immortalization of the human soul returned to Ithaca. Odysseus represents the higher self, the human mind that seeks the path of deification. The mind is fiery in nature and cannot enter matter unless it is surrounded by the ethereal tunics of the soul, according to Plato, which is literally cool Pull it to enter the body because otherwise it will burn it. The journey of the soul in the world and the exponential course of man codified in verses 
of this unsuppressed epic of the divine poet of the Greek intellectuality and the key of the interpretation of the well-hidden secret. The Greek language is the perfect tool of the divine word of the exponent of substance in the world of matter. The Odyssey is primarily an inner journey into the Poseidonian Sea of Emotion, a purgatory, a purgatory, curse of soul from the evil of matter that has two guidelines, the conquest of virtue and the acquisition of mysterious knowledge in the incarnate state. Philosophy shows us exactly how we can be purified. Keep the Ithaca in your mind. Thank you very much, Yanis, uh, for that veritable odyssey to the Odyssey. And you, you, you've uh, um, uh, turned over so, so many stones on, on the way to show us many different things that we certainly didn't imagine uh, were, were, were lying on, on the path. So thanks for giving of your time so generously today and for creating some really um, beautifully evocative um, images that will remain with us, I'm sure. Uh, we, we, we've um, we've overrun, I think, our time, and people here will be needing to get to trains. So I, I, I think we, we perhaps should uh, bring yes, this yes. meeting to the end, uh, to, to an end. Um, uh, unless anyone's got any, any, any quick uh, points they would like to it's make. Not, um, I just, if I just do my part of the, Yanni. No, don't move. Uh, I wish uh, I didn't make you tired. <laughs> um, uh, for sure, you may felt, of course, this. Um, it was the least I could do to be able to describe that phenomena for you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, what, what one of the one of our guests here would like like to say something. She's 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 just coming to the. Uh, thank you, Anis. Um, uh, if I may ask a question, please, uh, about chronology. Um, about? Uh, chronology. The chronology. Uh, about time. Uh, chronology of uh, gametria. You've talked a lot about gametria between... Uh, uh, about the alphanumeric, yes, yes. yes. And uh, um, the late Danish philologist, Dr. Christian Lindner, he, persuaded, he's, he described to me uh, about geometria uh, uh, and the geometry of, of the Greeks and the geometry of the Hebrew. Yes. Uh, and he said that it was the, the Hebrews that copied uh, the, the geometry mm -hmm. uh, and that they, that in fact, in his analysis, he makes uh, Jesus is actually Zeus in the New Testament. And I just wondered if you'd ever uh, followed any of that kind of comparison. You, you, you compare uh, throughout your, your talk uh, between Christianity in, in certain respects and, uh, and so on. I just wondered if you'd made any study about that. Yes, I did. Uh, on the, um, uh, the, the chapter of uh, Christianity, it was, um, uh, it was recorded in Greek. When Jesus, he was speaking to Pontius Pilatus, he didn't speak Hebrew nor Latin. They said to him, see Ipas. They didn't have a translator. He spoke to him in Greek. All of his teachings, it was neoplatonic. According to the Greek philosophy, Apollo, the son, he sits on the right of the father. Uh, the, there chronology, is a book, the, the chronology, the, which came first? Which came the, first? The, the Greeks. Greek? The Greeks. You, it is not possible to, for the Greeks to copy the Hebrews because the Greeks develop incredible civilization. How they, co they copy a great civilization and the other civilization, they didn't left a historical mark or um, literal, literature. 
what I'm saying to you, there is a book called Hebrew is Greek by Joseph Yehuda. Joseph Yehuda is the greatest, one of the greatest Hebrew linguists. The, the, the name of the book is called Hebrew is Greek. And there he shows all of this, what I'm saying to you now. This was existed before. I would like you to remind you that when Moses, he was a priest in Heliopolis in Egypt, a minor civilization had three floor houses with toilets, bathrooms, and the seismic technology and an incredible spirituality. So it was a much later understanding. Zematria is based on that. To be able to understand what I say in a very brief word, just you can see the hermetic text of Genesis and the Genesis itself. They copy paste Hermes Trismegistus. Can you spell the surname of the, the author that you? Joseph Yehuda. Hebrew is Greek. 1981 Oxford Publications. You can find it on uh, internet archives for free now because Yahuba. Joseph Yahuda, Hebrew Yahuba. is Greek, yeah, yeah. Oxford Publications. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. They are archetypes. They, uh, whoever made the Gospels, actually, they, they follow the archetypical journey of Odysseus and other mythological stories. It was an incredible work what they've done, actually, for this. It's amazing. It's a All right. Well, so, uh, thanks so much. That sounds like a really good, uh, good um, question that uh, Michelle has put. So I, I think uh, if, if no one online uh, has any other uh, points. I think I'll close the meeting. Thanks, everyone, for. Uh, yeah, oh, we've got some applause here. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the time. I'm sorry for the time being. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm just a soul whose intentions are good. <laughs> oh, Lord. Absolutely. That, that, that totally can't, um, comes across, uh, Yanis. You, your, 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 your spirit has communicated itself to this medium, and we're very grateful for it. it it's been a very good. Uh, experience so i i will um uh uh just just formally um blow the candle out um aquelis gal dog loafer corner ever in there maki over in the air isa eva camera of at not skull code but hello dear thanks very much uh yanis have, have, have a good sleep and we'll be in, in touch um bye bye everyone good, see good you in greece bye yeah, we'll see you in Greece sometime. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks, Edith. Thanks, Catherine, Linda, and Tony. Uh, I should see uh, Tony and Edith uh, probably on Sunday, I hope. Bye bye bye. For the, for the bye. Next bye bye. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you.